Hi students, today we continue with the next part of translation. In our previous class, we have discussed about uh, what is translation and also we have discussed the steps uh, only initiation step of prokaryotic as well as eukaryotic translation. Now in this class, we will complete translation all the steps and then we will discuss what is polysome, what is protein targeting, what are the various post translational modification, we will tell you about the inhibitors of protein synthesis, we will compare the translation in prokaryotes and eukaryotes and last year we will be discussing about the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA and its associated disorders. So, I hope you can understand this class will be lengthy. Uh, with the time gone, I think barely we will be able to complete in an hour. So, this was the last slide. So, if you have not seen the last class, previous lecture, kindly go back, watch it and then come back here. So, we paused here. This is the step, the last or the ultimate step of initiation where all the, both the subunits of ribosome along with the mRNA is attached. The initial, that is the first amino acyl tRNA is has already identified the start codon that is AUG and methionine has attached to the tRNA. In case of prokaryotes, it will be FMET that is formyl methionine. So, this is the ultimate initiation complex. In case of eukaryotes, it is ATS ribosome assembly. Next, what happens? This is the last step of initiation and this is the first step of elongation. So, what happens in elongation? Uh, just see, I will be just discussing the figures only. I will be elaborating the figures and you will be able to write the answers on your own if you see what is there in your textbook. Now, see, the first codon that is AUG has been identified by amino acyl tRNA or specifically methionyl tRNA that contains methionine. As an exception, this is the only tRNA that comes and attaches to the P site. However, all the other tRNA, the incoming tRNA will come and attach to the A site. Okay? So, again, let me tell you, the first tRNA, amino acyl tRNA will come and bind to the P site. After that, all other tRNA will come and attached to the A site, peptidyl site and amino acyl site or A site we can loosely call it an acceptor site because it accepts the new tRNA that contains the targeted amino acid. Now, what happens? The anticodon arm will identify the codes in 3. So, first 3 methionine, the next 3 whatever the mRNA is coding. So, in this case the next 3 is ACC. Remember, the first six are read together because the P site and A site are side by side. So, the formyl methionyl or the methionyl tRNA will come and bind to the P site and the next one will come and bind to the A site depending on this code. Here, this is ACC and it codes for 309. So, the next tRNA that has 309 attached to the CCA arm, okay, the acceptor arm comes and binds. Now, what happens? EF, this is elongation factor. In initiation, we read those are all initiation factors. EF over here is elongation factor 1. So, EF1 utilizes one GTP molecule. So, one high energy phosphate bond is utilized, okay. Hydrolysis occurs and what it does? it helps in shifting of this one. The methionine from the P site tRNA to the A site tRNA. Look very closely. The A site tRNA already has 309. Elongation factor 1 does what? It shifts this methionine to the 309 with the help of a peptide bond. Simply a peptide bond has formed between methionine and 309. Right Now, this tRNA which originally contained methionine is vacant. It has got nothing. It has no amino acid attached to its acceptor arm. So, this is the CCA arm of the tRNA. 
Now, depending on which textbook you are reading, there may be two outcomes. The final outcome is that this initial tRNA will be expelled from the P site. The tag, if your textbook says it is directly expelled from the P site and you are drawing this figure, it's fine. If your textbook says it is then shifted to the E site or exit site and then it is removed, both are fine. Ultimately, the tRNA which is devoid of any amino acid will be removed. Now, this tRNA which is bound to the A site which has just received an additional amino acid from the P site will now get shifted to the P site. This is the translocation process. If it is unclear, just see what is happening over here. This tRNA at the A site is just shifting to the P site. This is translocation. Along with that, what happens? The whole mRNA assembly moves forward by three places because the A site has now a job to identify the next triplet codon. So, this is the whole translocation process. The whole mRNA assembly moves forward by three spaces because it has to now accommodate the incoming codon. The tRNA which was occupying the A site now goes to the P site. Okay, so this is translation. Next, what happens? Depending on this one, see now this is GGG. GGG codes for glycine. So, then again, a new amino acyl tRNA that contains glycine will now come and attach to the A site. Another elongation factor 2 will utilize a GTP and it will transfer this whole thing methionine threonine to glycine. So, if we see the next step what will happen? It will be methionine threonine and glycine attached to this tRNA at the A site. Then again it will move to the P site and then another amino acid will come and in this way a long chain of polypeptides will be formed. Fine. Now, one important thing here is the first transfer requires elongation factor 1, subsequent transfer needs elongation factor 2, okay. So, the first translocation and the second translocation. So, in order to form a peptide bond, how many high energy phosphate bonds are utilized? Just hear me out. So, what is the translocation process? Let us see what I just described now. Let us see one by one what is happening. The tRNA fixed at the P site does not carry any amino acid and is therefore released from the ribosome. What we are referring to? We are referring to this one. Okay, this one. This tRNA which is now fixed to the P site has got no amino acid will be detached from the ribosome. Next, the whole ribosome moves over through the mRNA through a distance of 3 bases. The peptidyl tRNA is translocated to the P site. Why we call it peptidyl tRNA not amino acyl tRNA? Amino acyl tRNA means a tRNA where there is only one amino acid. Peptidyl tRNA means 2, a peptide bond has already formed. So, that is a peptidyl tRNA. You get my point? This peptidyl tRNA is translocated to the P site. This is done with the help of EF2. Now, the A site is ready to receive yet another amino acyl tRNA bearing the appropriate anticodon. The new amino acyl tRNA will be fixed to the A site and this base pairing happens with the help of GTP. So, uh, we all know the translocation requires the GTP hydrolysis. So, if you are asked how many high energy phosphate bonds are used in each peptide bond formation, just see this diagram. Okay, this translocation also needs a GTP. This whole thing will use another peptide bond that is the upcoming step which I have not shown here. So, one peptide bond formation requires four high energy phosphate bond, two for the initial activation. You remember in last class we discussed ATP breaks down to AMP. 
So two high energy phosphate bonds were getting utilized in the activation of amino acid. Both the amino acids are being activated or charged. Then one EF one step GTP to GDP and then one for elongation factor two step. So one peptide bond needs four high energy phosphate bond, one peptide bond formation. Actually this high energy phosphate bond is high energy from the phosphate bonds breakdown is not directly incorporated into the peptide bond. You know why? Because uh, the amino acids are pre-activated. So amino acids are already activated. We are just calculating the total amount of energy. Okay. Needless to say, you need one peptide. You need to know one peptide bond requires four high energy peptide phosphate bonds. One peptide equals to four high energy phosphate. This is MCQ. Right. And furthermore, one ATP is used for initiation complex formation. Remember 50S, I mean 60S was coming and joining with the 40S in order to form the 80S. That whole assembly needed one extra ATP. Okay. So if we calculate uh, one GTP is required for termination, one GTP for 80S formation, this thing it may seem complex, you just ignore this one. For proper MCQ purpose, just remember one peptide bond will need four high energy phosphate bond. That is a must know area. Otherwise, if you just draw the diagram, these things will come automatically. Okay, if you follow both the classes, this is very obvious. Next, we move on to termination. Now see, this whole thing, okay, this whole process will continue. It will continue to add more and more polypeptides till we reach a stop signal. What is the stop signal? This is nothing but the termination codon. Okay. What are the termination codon? I will not ask you. You, you better know the termination codon by now. So during termination, another GTP is hydrolyzed. There is a involvement of something called RF or releasing factor. It releases the it releases everything. The whole assembly is released. Both the subunits of ribosome, the mRNA, all the elongation factors, everything will be released when the stop codon is reached. And thus, ultimately, we will have a polypeptide chain with the starting N terminal and the ending C terminal. Remember, when you get translation, you need to write something in your own words about the elongation and termination steps. I just described the diagram that is enough. If you give a diagram in your answer script and if you explain them in your own words, it's fine. But remember, if you write pages after pages, but do not give any diagram, that's not good. Okay, diagram is a must and it's expected. Now, uh, there is something more to this. Of course, translation is now over. Okay, but it can't be over, <laughs> right? So what extra happens? We got the desired protein. Suppose this is our desired protein, which has got specific, say 12 amino acid. This is the desired primary structure. Still for this protein to function properly, it needs to be delivered from ribosome to some other organelle. And that organelle is endoplasmic reticulum, right? So, Okay, before we learn about protein targeting, we should learn at least one line about polyribosome. Polysome or polyribosome will come as a five mark short note. Believe me, in that case, you just need to write this line and you need to draw this diagram. And it depends upon your stretching skills, how you can elaborate this simple line in your own language. Okay, so just see what is the definition of polyribosome. A polysome or polyribosome is a group of ribosomes bound to an mRNA molecule, a single mRNA, like beads on a thread, okay, Galeka Mala. It consists of a complex of mRNA molecule and two or more ribosomes that can translate mRNA instruction into polypeptide. Got my point? So, just ratify this exact definition. 
it's very easy to understand if you just look at this figure and then you can simply write in a point wise fashion polyribosome is a group of ribosomes bound to an mrna it looks like beads on a thread it consists of a complex of mrna molecule and two ribosome it functions in translating mrna instruction to polypeptides it is also known as ergosome like this so write four or five points be smart and draw this diagram and then you will get almost 5 upon 5 okay but don't miss anything this is polyribosome and this diagram i have i think it exists in vasudevan also or any textbook for that matter so this is polyribosome next protein targeting okay so now synthesis of protein is done but as i told you a uh, protein in order to reach an endoplasmic reticulum okay so just imagine the protein being a letter it needs to be delivered to an address so what is the address the address that needs to be written on the envelope is signal peptide so again signal peptide will also come as a short note this one moment so what is signal peptide a signal peptide is a short peptide its length is generally 16 to 30 amino acids long where it is present it is present at the end terminal of the majority of newly synthesized proteins okay what proteins proteins that are destined towards the secretory pathway what is the organelle that governs the secretory pathway that is endoplasmic reticulum so you can simply write that is destined towards er endoplasmic reticulum so what is signal peptide it's nothing imagine a protein has formed its end terminal there will be few more polypeptides or amino acid that will be attached a 16 to 30 chain a 16 to 30 amino acid long chain will be attached to the end terminal that will act as an address this is known as signal peptide it is known by many names depending on the textbook that you are reading it is also referred as signal sequence targeting signal localization signal so on and so forth leader sequence is a very common term okay so see what happens this signal peptide if it is present at the end terminal of a newly synthesized protein this signal peptide can come and align itself properly to the channel or the opening or the pore of endoplasmic reticular membrane then what happens first the signal peptide is delivered and by catching his hand finally the new pro synthesized protein is also delivered inside the endoplasmic reticulum thereafter the signal peptide is destroyed but it's essential to have a signal peptide for almost all proteins because almost all proteins need to function some or the other need to have some or the other function okay so a signal peptide is attached to a protein that signal peptide helps the protein to reach the endoplasmic reticulum address now this is the schematic diagram in some textbook you will have an elaborate diagram okay in a 2d fashion i have also included that so just follow this this is not difficult okay just try to visualize what is happening over here first see what are the abbreviations Deco, this is representing the newly synthesized proteins this is the smaller subunit together it forms the larger subunit the total assembly this is the mrna and this is the newly synthesized protein this needs to reach the endoplasmic reticulum so this protein has got a peptide as which is signal peptide at its end terminal end so see this number four this is the signal peptide may i rub this okay it's too dirty you can easily visualize if you just see the labeling two additional things that you need to know in order to 
in order for the signal peptide to be recognized in the endoplasmic reticulum, you need some address at the delivery site also. It's just a simple concept. You write a letter, you put an address on the letter. Okay, now the postman has to carry that letter and that letter needs to be delivered to an address. So, unless that address has got a name plate, it will be very difficult for the postman also to deliver, right? So, those things are nothing but the signal peptide receptor, okay, and the SRP that is signal peptide recognition particle. So, SRP and SRPR, signal peptide recognition particle and signal peptide recognition particle receptor. Basically, those are addresses or the name plates at the delivery site. So, when those are present, what happens? Signal peptide goes and aligns itself with the endoplasmic reticulum opening. See, this is the endoplasmic reticulum opening. It has properly aligned. Why? Because these are present. The signal peptide and signal peptide receptor proteins are present, which recognizes the signal peptide. And now, in next step, what happens? The signal, the signal peptide is properly aligned and it has gone through the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And following this, what happens? Our newly synthesized protein will also get inserted in the endoplasmic reticulum. See, this is the thing that is happening. We have just magnified this thing. So, first the signal peptide is aligned to this one. First the signal peptide goes and following this one, the main protein goes. This is the exact thing that is happening. But we have zoomed it. We have made a schematic diagram and you can just see the labels. This is a small subunit. This is the MRN, this is the large subunit, this is the signal peptide, signal peptide recognition particle and this is the receptor and this is the ER membrane, right? So, unless you get a long question related to signal peptide, you don't need to draw so much, just draw one diagram. Either you can draw this one or you can draw this one and you need to write what is signal peptide and you also need to mention that the receptor site that is endoplasmic reticulum contains these two that is signal peptide recognition particle and signal peptide recognition particle receptor okay so this is about protein targeting the normal thing okay now i am deliberately going in a hurry because i need to finish but trust me all these are separate short question as a part of long question so each of them can come as either short note or as part of a structured long question. Suppose translation comes, it may have a three mark uh, segment on what is what are the various post translational processing events or what is protein targeting or what is signal peptide like that. So be ready for each and every section, but all of them are important. Otherwise, I will not be, I wouldn't have been telling you, right? So what are the post translational processing? It is a very important viva question like post transcriptional processing in which you read capping, tailing, alternate splicing, RNA editing, etc. Post translational processing is also very important and you will be asked at least two or three examples in viva. So, number one most important example is proteolytic cleavage. What is proteolytic cleavage? A big protein is first formed and then it is broken down into small functional fragments. The most important example is pro-insulin to insulin, okay? Next, a huge part is modification of amino acid. In modification of amino acid, the first and foremost important example that will also come in physiology are gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid of prothrombin. Basically, not only prothrombin, factor 2, 7, 9 and 10, all the factors that are synthesized by liver and vitamin K plays a role. So, all of them are carboxylated at gamma position and that is a post translational modification. So, the first the, uh, these factors are synthesized and then it is carboxylated. Next, proline, hydroxyproline and lysine and hydroxylysine. You have read those proteins, okay. Why? Because that was the first chapter I taught you in person, right? Collagen. So, in collagen, apart from proline and lysine, there are hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. Those hydroxylations are vitamin C dependent, ascorbate dependent and they take 
place or they happen after the translation process has completed. So post translational modification. So these three are the most important. So if examiner expects any answer from you, these three are the most important. And the later phosphorylation, methylation of histones and glycosylation are important, but I have not given you specific examples. Because if you utter these in exam, examiner will be asking you examples and you will not be able to answer and then you will get less marks. So why go in that pathway? Simple answer, proteolytic cleavage, formation of insulin, modification of amino acid number 1, gamma carboxylation clotting factor and collagen hydroxylation. Okay. Next, proteolytic cleavage and modification of amino acid. Next type of post-translational processing is subunit aggregation. Means the tertiary structure of proteins that are fully functional, some of them have got many subunits which join to form a final quaternary structure. For example, hemoglobin has got 2 alpha and 2 beta. Okay, you very well know what is quaternary structure of protein that has got subunit. So, those subunit aggregation are also post-translational modification. So, hemoglobin, immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin, IgM has got 5 subunit, for example. All those are happening after the translation has completed. Next is protein folding by chaperons. Important, very important. It has got separate question. So all of them can invite question in viva, especially this one, collagen from here, examiner will go into collagen. From carboxylation of clotting factor, examiner will go into coagulation cascade, internal external pathways. Be ready. And last but not the least, in case of insulin, they will ask you the structure of insulin, they will ask you what is C peptide and they will ask you how blood glucose level is maintained, what is type 1 and type 2 diabetes. All these questions from simple translation is a very important linker, right? So that being said, let us discuss the structure of insulin. I will not be going into details, most of you already know, you have studied. Uh, what, what is the number of peptides in case of the A chain and B chain? You need to know where are the intra-chain and inter-chain disulfide bonds. But most importantly, when pro-insulin breaks down to normal insulin, you see the pink colors, pink colored ones have made its way to the final insulin structure. But this one, this light pink, this whole segment is C-peptide. It has got applied importance. What is the applied importance? You see, for each molecule of insulin that is produced, hear me out very carefully, exactly you need to see, see say these words. For each molecule of insulin that is produced in the body, one molecule of C-peptide is produced. Now, insulin is utilized in the body for various metabolic functions. However, C-peptide is inert and its concentration is unaltered due to any metabolic processes, fine. So in order to get the insulin status of the patient, suppose the patient is diabetic or any problem, suppose the patient is having insulin resistance, we cannot exactly measure the insulin amount. Why? Because insulin is getting constantly utilized. However, if we measure the C-peptide amount, it gives us a direct, it gives us an indirect but very precise idea about the insulin level. You get my point? For one molecule of insulin, one molecule of C-peptide is produced but insulin is getting utilized. So, if we assess C-peptide, we will indirectly have an idea that how much insulin is produced from the, say, islets of Langerhans. Okay? So it's very essential, C-peptide and all these questions may be invited from simple post-translational modification. Now, uh, you may be asked, uh, what name some reversible and name some irreversible post-translational modifications, okay? Then you need to consider some other name processes. See, these are also some post-translational processing that happens, okay? The final proteins are processed after translation. These are also modifications. However, a covalent modification that is in structure where a new bond is formed are these. So, disulfide bridge is formed. For example, in this one, an insulin. 
okay after proteolytic cleavage a disulfide bridge is getting formed okay so disulfide bridge glycosylation phosphorylation acetylation anything and irreversible means proteolysis so all these things see proteolytic cleavage this is an irreversible ubiquitination lysine hydroxylation collagen again irreversible proline hydroxylation irreversible methylation irreversible however just remember two reversible otherwise the main post translational modification that i asked you to remember most of them are irreversible so if you remember them irreversible you can answer fine but reversible any two of these okay acetylation adiporibosylation disulfide bridge anything so just remember the which are reversible and which are irreversible but please prepare your own notes these things will not get time to go through your textbook pages and revise before the day of exam but trust me this will be asked and will be dumbfound unless you prepared them previously oh god such a big slide okay not exactly now see we learned about protein targeting right i told you protein targeting is nothing but addition of a signal peptide right so what if that thing is defective i gave you the analogy of an address on an envelope so see all these diseases what happens there is a defect in signal peptide or defect in protein targeting so this address is not properly printed on the protein packet and hence it cannot be delivered to the exact locality where it should properly function okay so in all these diseases the problem is improper delivery mechanism of the functional protein unless the protein can reach its desired target area it cannot function properly so all these diseases are related to defect in protein targeting so for you what you need to know you need to know name of this zellweger syndrome very important this name you must know this is an mcq and what is the defect defect in oxidation of very long chain fatty acid okay why what is the problem who would have helped in oxidation of long chain fatty acid you know you should remember that long oxidation of very long chain fatty acids happens in peroxisomes so the enzymes those are the proteins that should have been delivered to the peroxisomes in order to oxidize these very long chain fatty acids they are not properly delivered so peroxisomal enzymes are produced but their entry into the peroxisome is denied get my point this leads to an insufficient oxidation of vls cfa very long chain fatty acid and then what happens these very long chain fatty acids accumulates in the cns and these cause very grave diseases and it leads to death also zellweger syndrome the child usually dies very young so it causes neurological impairment and death in childhood apart from that you need to know only name so zellweger syndrome you need to know the mechanism very long chain fatty acid peroxisomal enzyme defect but same thing primary hyper oxaluria means oxalate stones are formed in kidneys again why a protein which should have deli been delivered in the kidney which helps in excretion is not delivered so early age stones are formed in kidney similarly fi familiar hypercholesterolemia defective cholesterol transport signals they are defective i mean the cholesterol transport proteins should have been delivered to a target cell but due to defect in protein targeting they have not been delivered and ultimately it has led to familial hypercholesterolemia means at some age the cholesterol level should have been very low but it is very very high at a young age okay and last is inclusion cell disease that you don't need to remember zellweger syndrome very important primary hyperoxaluria familial hypercholesterolemia these are fine next so protein folding uh, you saw in the last point of post translational modification we discussed about protein folding and chaperon 
most of you already know what is the role of chaperones. You see, uh, a primary structure or a protein is first synthesized in this way. Okay, it's a very long stretch of amino acids. Right? But in reality, we now know that this primary structure will be folded to form either one alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet and then these will again be folded to form a tertiary structure which is the functional unit and then subunits will form quaternary structure. So, the proteins, there are certain proteins which help in folding of these proteins, okay. These are chaperones and defect of those chaperones will lead to diseases of protein folding or proteins will be misfolded okay if chaperons are sick and those diseases are known as chaperonopathies i have not included the names of those diseases this is your homework okay there are multiple chaperon related diseases kuru krusfeld jacob disease mad cow disease also alzheimer's disease parkinson's disease all those are due to defective protein folding okay some are in animals and some are in human beings so those names you need to remember at least two protein folding diseases or chaperonopathies you need to know but in simple language these are the agents okay which helps in the folding of this primary structure so that they can attain a three-dimensional structure normally in physiological condition however due to defect in them proteins will be misfolded they will uh, attain an alternate or incorrect spatial conformation and that will lead to certain abnormal function and various diseases which are known as chaperonopathies okay next we come to difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic translation this is actually very easy i will be just reading them but i am sure if you have understood both the prokaryotic and eukaryotic this is not too difficult See, first we need to write about the different ribosomal subunit. This is actually very important. The most important perhaps. Translation in prokaryotes starts before transcription is completed. Okay. Because there is no mRNA processing. Whatever mRNA is being produced, the translation machinery jumps into that in order to synthesize proteins. But transcription and translation are well separated in mammals because mRNA is processed first and then it is translated. In case of uh, prokaryotes, the AUG codon is uh, identified by Shine Dalgarno. Here it is done by Kozak sequence, already discussed in last video. Here it carries formylated methionine, here it carries only methionine, that is the initiating tRNA. Over here, initiation factors. GTP hydrolysis are required for binding of small ribosomal subunit to the mRNA, right? More or less similar, several initiation factors, that is eukaryotic initiation factors and GTP hydrolysis are required for the formation of initiation complex. I told you, first mRNA binds over there and then tRNA binds, but over there, first initiation complex is formed. Next, over here, this is also important, peptidyl transferase enzyme, that is Translocation, okay, is in the 23S RNA. Over here, it is in the 28S RNA of the large subunit, okay. The translocation of the peptidyl transfer is from A site to P site. Post translational modification, mainly co translational modification. What happens? Along with translation, modification start to happen in case of prokaryotes. You see, it is everything is in a hurry. Once translation, transcription is not over, translation starts. Translation is not completed. Simultaneously, translate, post-translational modification takes place. But over here, first transcription is completed, it is processed. Then translation is completed and then it is processed. Okay. Lastly, we look at the inhibitors of translation. Mainly the inhibitors of prokaryotic translation are antibiotics. Okay. And inhibitors of eukaryotic translation are number one poisons that are or toxins from produced from bacteria like diphtheria toxin 
or poisons like ricin that is present in ricinus communis or rita okay that is ricin is a very important homicidal poison how many of you have seen the breaking bad anyway and chemotherapeutic agents like puromycin and cyclohexamide okay so this is important in them specifically questions will be asked from these because these often comes as mcqs so this is one thing that you need to memorize from your textbook there is no other way to remember inhibitors of replication inhibitors of transcription and inhibitors of translation so all inhibitors of dna rna and protein synthesis are important for mcq purpose okay i give you out a question last time i made a model question for you guys in that question i gave this one tetracyclines inhibit protein synthesis by and i gave four options the correct option would have been attach inhibition of attachment of amino acid tRNA to the a site of ribosome you get my point so any of them so tetracycline chloramphenicol all of them are antibiotics okay these help in reversibly stopping the translation so these act as bacteriostatic they are reversible means it pauses however if there is an increased load of bacteria the translation process will continue hence this is these are all bacteriostatic antibiotics same erythromycin clindamycin if any of you belong to a medico family these are all common antibiotics that are prescribed in case of any infection suppose throat infection you will be taught in pharma that all bacteriostatic antibiotics also needs body immunity because the growth of bacteria is stopped and then the body defense mechanism must wash away all the bacteria right however the there are few irreversible inhibitors those are known as bactericidal for example streptomycin they will simply kill the bacteria so there is no need for to worry about the body immune system all right so you must be asking then if bactericidal antibiotic exist why do we worry about bacteriostatic antibiotics because the antibiotic that is fully killing the bacteria is much more is much better right yes they are better in terms of bacteria killing but these are much more toxic side effects are huge in case of bactericidal antibiotics for example streptomycin if given a long dose streptomycin was initially used in treatment of tuberculosis okay four five drugs was used in case of tb treatment but streptomycin produces ototoxicity we have seen many seniors who have completely lost their hearing because of tuberculosis treatment due to streptomycin toxicity but for now you need to know bacteriostatic antibiotic are those antibiotic that reversibly stops translation and you need to know mechanism of at least tetracycline and chloramphenicol in your textbook you will find a chart where the names of these inhibitors and their mechanism of action are given believe me you need to memorize at least four or five of them very important now we see we learn about eukaryotic inhibitors these are mainly chemotherapeutic agent because these are killing eukaryotic cells or cells of higher organism right so just need to know the names and the mechanism of action so cyclohexamide puromycin among them diphtheria toxin is a short note okay you will be asked to explain why diphtheria toxin the mechanism of action of cholera toxin mechanism of action of pertussis toxin and mechanism of action of diphtheria toxin cholera toxin will produce diarrhea pertussis toxin will produce whooping cough and diphtheria toxin will also produce excess sore throat answer is in one word only it causes inactivation of elongation factor 2 how by attachment of adp bus as simple as that in case of cyclohexamide it inhibits peptidyl transferase of 60s subunit so these are things that you need to memorize but if diphtheria toxin mechanism of diphtheria toxin comes as a question you need to mention this one inactivation of elongation factor 2 okay some 
inhibitors of transcription okay will also inhibit translation processes so inhibitors of transcription and translation need to learn together and now we go to our last segment time is almost up we have 5 minutes left it is mitochondrial dna to be honest in mitochondrial dna you just need to know what is the difference from normal dna we have already discussed the difference when we were discussing about the genetics or the codes so let me minimize this slide and let us just go back and take a look at a glance how mitochondrial dna is differing how mitochondrial genetic code is differing first of all mitochondrial dna is circular okay it is present inside the mitochondria the initiation codon or the one that was uh, forming methionine in cell a normal cell does not code for methionine in mitochondria in mitochondria the code which was giving us isoleucine codes for methionine and we also learned the termination codons of mitochondria are different and the termination codon of eukaryotic cell codes for tryptophan in mitochondria so if mitochondrial dna comes as a short note this is a very good chart to write okay next what you need to write is this mitochondrial dna of all this most importantly most of mitochondrial proteins are encoded by nuclear dna and synthesized in cytoplasm okay this line you need to mention okay next line that you need to mention is the inheritance so how mitochondrial dna is inherited it is inherited from maternal now see th th there is a uh, difference which is comparing both eukaryotes prokaryotes and mitochondrial dna uh, see mitochondrial dna has got similarities to prokaryotes okay mainly because it's circular the ribosome is 70s ribosome trna total is 22 in number the first initiating amino acyl trna consists of formyl methionine and tetracycline inhibits both however as i told you there are few codons which are different in both the prokaryotic and mitochondrial dna this is important maternal inheritance mitochondrial disease can only be inherited from mother when we draw pedigrees thankfully pedigrees are not included in your undergraduate syllabus i think it was included in your plus 2 syllabus but uh, you don't worry about pedigrees now pedigrees are not included so if mother has got some mitochondrial disease it has got a high chance to be transferred to the offspring generally there are hundreds of copies of mitochondrial dna in each cell nuclear dna has only two copies so if mutation occurs in mitochondrial dna daughter cells may inherit mutant or normal mitochondrial dna you get my point why any problem in nucleus because nucleus has got only two copies of dna any problem will of course get transferred in case of any nuclear dna defect or simple dna defect however mitochondrial dna has got so many that one defect in mitochondrial dna may or may not pass to the daughter right why we ask daughter a son may also inherit but the son will not transfer this disease to the next generation okay next it has got high mutation rate and accumulation of mutation in mitochondrial dna may be responsible for age related degenerative diseases so what are the age related degenerative diseases discussing about that we will come now we are finally at our last slide okay too many information in this class but i intended to complete so that we don't need any other additional videos for this translation okay it's it can be completed in two sections so see you just need to know the names of each of them and common symptom of all of them are neurological disorders neuro 
लॉजिकल डिजॉर्डर्स सी एक्सेप्शन इज ओनली लेबर हियर आई इज डिफेक्ट एफेक्टेड अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैम माओक्रोनिक एपिलेप्सी मायोपैथी डिमेंशिया लैक्टिक एसिडोसिस सीजर डिमेंशिया मूवमेंट डिजॉर्डर सो ऑल ऑफ दैम आर कैटेगराइज और कैरेक्टराइज बाई न्यूरोलॉजिकल डिजॉर्डर of course optic nerve is damaged it is also neurological disorder but by neurological disorder we mainly mean seizures or forgetfulness or dementia or movement abnormalities so what are the mitochondrial diseases lh1 leber's hereditary optic neuropathy this is a very important mcq for neat pg exam you need to a leber's is given an option is inheritance of mitochondrial dna inheritance from mother so a, all of them so marf okay mild chronic epilepsy ragged red fiber disease melas mitochondrial encephalopathy lactic acidosis and stroke like episode this i have discussed while teaching complex 1 and i told you complex 1 defect actually produces all these might are due to defect in mitochondrial dna okay so now the circle is completed so lay syndrome you don't need to know at all unless you are watching this video and you are a pg student in that case you need to make a comment and then i will discuss elaborately about lay syndrome so for ug students just know these three names melas marf and lebers in case of lebers the defect is in eye blindness and all other mitochondrial disorder neurological defective mainly with age with age these diseases show up not in absolutely young exception is lebers lebers actually shows up in quite young age and inheritance of all of them are from mother so we come to the end of our class so thanks a lot for watching this video feel please feel free to get back to me in the comment section and i will see you soon with another exciting video till then bye and take care